Hello and welcome to Mel Make Stuff. My name is Melissa and in today's special episode we are going to be talking about yarns that are made from plant fibers. With summer quickly approaching here in the Northern Hemisphere, I'm really looking forward to knitting with some of these plant fiber yarns. These yarns would be ones made of linen, cotton, bamboo, tencel and rayon or cellulose fibers also, and in some cases silk uh, I would consider to behave like a plant fiber even though it is technically a protein fiber. If you haven't worked with plant fiber yarns before, it can be hard to anticipate exactly how that finished garment is going to behave. So the plan for today is that we are going to discuss the characteristics of some of these types of yarns. We're going to look at some of the yarns that I already have in my stash, and then we are going to take those yarns and compare them to some of these finished garments that I have here so that you can see based on what the yarn looks like in the skein or in the hank or in the ball, however it comes, you might be able to anticipate how it's going to behave in the finished garment. The main thing that the vast majority of these plant fiber yarns will have in common is that they have little to no elasticity themselves. Like the actual yarn itself is very firm and not elastic, unlike wool. This lack of inherent elasticity in the yarn itself will often result in the garment having a lot of drape, which is really nice for a summer garment a lot of the time. However, these yarns don't grip onto themselves in the finished fabric and sort of fill in the spaces or bloom in the same way that wool often does, and so you'll often end up with a fabric that is more or less a little bit see-through. And again, that lack of elasticity in these yarns will make them a little bit less forgiving to knit with, to get used to working with. And so they'll show a little bit more of the inconsistencies in your tension at first and that sort of thing. If anyone is familiar with the term rowing out, it's when you're knitting flat in stockinette and so you are knitting on the right side and purling on the wrong side and your purls will sometimes be a slightly different tension than your knits, it's very common. And so something like that might not be as obvious in a wool garment, but it will tend to be more obvious in a plant fiber garment. What can you tell about the potential behavior of the fabric when the yarn is still in a ball or in a skein? Or if you don't have it in person and you're just trying to buy online. I find that yarns don't really tend to start behaving like a plant fiber until we're getting above 50% plant fiber. So if you're seeing a yarn that's like 50% wool, 50% cotton, something like that is likely going to behave more like a wool. If you get up into the 70% cotton, 30% something else, at that point it'll start behaving a little bit more like a plant fiber. If you have access to the yarn in person, doing a swatch is going to tell you a lot about what that finished fabric will do, more so than if you're just swatching with wool for gauge. Swatching will not only give you the chance to check your gauge and make sure that it's appropriate for the project that you're doing, but it will also give you a chance to test out the needle that you're using. Because for me, I always use a wooden needle for a plant fiber yarn. They just go together from my personal knitting style. Your mileage may vary here. You might find that you are more comfortable on a metal needle, but what I have found is that the slight flexibility that's provided by a wooden needle when knitting with these very rigid yarns gives a little bit more give in the process and just makes it a little bit more comfortable of an experience for me personally. Of course, the bigger your swatch is, the more chance you're going to have to determine what the drape of the final garment is going to be like. Do I knit giant swatches? No, I do not. This is a recent swatch that I've done for a cotton, this is a largely cotton yarn with a little bit of cashmere in it. And so it's just about four inches wide, and probably three high. This is on average what I will do, but even something that's this size will give you a lot of clues about that finished fabric. So even just from a relatively small swatch here, I can tell that this finished garment is going to have a nice hand to it. It's going to be a very soft fabric. It's not uh, super rigid like you might find in a linen yarn, but I also don't have huge gaps between my stitches in this instance, and so I think that it should hold its shape relatively well. I don't get the impression that it's going to stretch out of shape. Another thing that this enabled me to do is to test how loosely I may need to cast off. Sometimes you need to cast off a little bit looser than you think with these types of yarns. It enables me to see if I have any inconsistencies in my tension, which are, if there are any here, are very minor. Uh, this is blocked, so it this is exactly what the finished fabric should end up looking like, and I am happy with the consistency of my stitches here. And the other very important thing that swatching will tell you is whether you are feeling any pain in your body. 
Knitting with plant fibers can be much harder on your hands and forearms than you would anticipate if you're used to working with wool or another very elastic fiber. If you haven't worked with plant fiber yarns in the past, one thing that is very common to do is to have too much tension as you're forming the stitches, and that can really put a lot of strain on your wrist and also your extensors up here in your forearm, and you really do not want to mess with that because you're going to have to take time off if you keep pushing it. Using the wooden needles helped me to get past that. The other thing that I will try to do is stay very relaxed in my motions. So one thing that I will often do if I'm swatching and I find that I'm getting gauge with whatever that needle is, but I feel like I'm pulling the yarn a little bit too much with whatever hand I'm using to tension it, I will stop and go down a needle size or even two and then lighten up on how hard I'm pulling that yarn around. It's really easy to get into different habits than you're used to because the yarns will feel so different than wool if that's what you're used to working with. This sort of technique will really vary person to person, so you do want to just try it out and see what will work best for you. I have gotten some questions about whether I knit close to the needle tips when I'm working with plant fiber yarns, and I do not. I don't knit any closer to the tip of the needle than normal when I'm using a plant fiber versus when I'm using a Wool. That widest part of your right hand needle as you're wrapping the yarn around is what is going to give you your gauge. So if you find that you're tempted to knit with the yarn too close to the needle tip because you perceive that it's giving you a better tension or you're, you're not able to get your stitches tight enough or whatever, at that point just go down a needle size and see what happens. If you do just push forward with wrapping very close to the needle tip, it would be very hard to do that in a consistent way across an entire project. So the potential for your fabric to be very inconsistent is, is higher that way. And I think it would be better to go down a needle size and experiment with wrapping in a more normal way for your own style of knitting in that case. Which patterns will work really well for plant fiber yarns? This can sometimes be tricky to figure out if you're trying to do a substitution especially. So what I will tend to do, I do use Ravelry a lot, and so what I will do is start off with a search on Ravelry, you can also search Instagram, for sleeveless or t-shirt style tops. If you are using Ravelry, you can also use the advanced search to limit the projects by yarn content. So you can choose linen, cotton. I'll usually go through and choose every plant fiber that they have listed there just so I can see the full range of search results. For my taste, the garments that I have found to be successful when made in plant fiber yarns will tend to have at least a couple of inches of positive ease. Again, going back to the elasticity of the yarns, the, the fabric itself will have mechanical stretch. If you have a piece of stockinette fabric, that fabric will stretch a little bit because of the structure of the stockinette stitch itself, but that yarn itself is not going to be stretching at all. So if you are trying to stretch a garment that has negative ease, or in some cases no ease, and you're trying to stretch it over your body as you're putting it on, you know, it can get really stretched over your shoulders or really stretch across the bust or stomach, it's very common. And so I will tend to look for garments that have at least two, three inches of positive ease is what I prefer when I'm working with these types of fibers. And when I'm talking about positive ease, just again, that means that the finished measurement of the garment is bigger than the measurement of your actual bust. Plant fibers will also tend to hold a nice block. And so another thing that I personally will look for is just a little bit of lace detail. I'm not really a lace knitter usually. It's not my, my preference for regular winter garments, but in a summer garment it can be a nice detail, you know, a lace detail on a stockinette garment or something like that. As you are looking through these patterns, and especially as you're looking at finished projects on Instagram or on Ravelry, however you're looking at them, be discerning about what you think that fabric of that finished garment looks like. Which yarn choices are successful and which ones aren't? Sometimes designers don't even get this right to my eye, so it's really a place where you can sort of develop your own thoughts about what looks good to you. One thing that I will personally see in a lot of these photos of finished garments is that the gauge is very, very loose, and so those garments will tend to stretch out of shape over time, and that's not necessarily something that I want in my finished garments, so I might make a different choice there without having to make the mistake myself. The manufacturer's stated gauge for whatever yarn you're using is sort of a good point to start. You can search by gauge on Ravelry as well, which is something that I like to do. And whatever finished fabric you got in your swatch, if you have found a gauge that you like in your swatch, then you can search using that gauge. What about subbing a plant fiber for wool in a pattern? It can certainly be done, but I always like to consider a few things first. Again, I'll be looking for just a little bit of positive ease at the very least, and I'll have to remember that that finished garment is definitely going to have more drape 
than the wool garment. And at that point, I have to think about how is that going to affect the style of the garment? You know, if it's a, a very structured pattern in the wool that it's originally written for, it might not be able to physically have that same type of structure in a plant fiber. And so sometimes that will work and look cool and sometimes it won't. And that's really a matter of your personal preference too. I like to look at existing projects and take note of the characteristics of those garments. Like, does it look like the pattern is meant to drape over the curves of the body? Or does it look like it has pieces like a collar that is meant to stand up a little bit more or a very structured shoulder, something like that. I might not sub in a plant fiber. You should keep in mind that the fabric might be more see-through than it is in the wool. So what would you plan to wear underneath it? I'm pretty much always wearing like a little, uh, very close to my skin color camisole underneath of my knitted garments. Uh, some of them I get away without anything underneath, but often I'll wear something like that. Traditional buttonholes are another feature that may not translate well into a plant fiber because oftentimes those buttonholes, like just on a regular cardigan, will depend on the elasticity of wool to bring themselves back into shape. And if you make a buttonhole like that in a plant fiber, sometimes they can get stretched out and really not look all that great. Again, it's really gonna depend on your yarn. You can always test out a buttonhole in a swatch if you want to really test it out. Or you can sub in a loop type buttonhole like the one that I have right here, which is something that I feel works really well in a plant fiber. Here you can just see, this is just a little crochet loop that I have put on here. And if that stretches out, it really doesn't matter all that much. So now let's get into looking at some actual garments. Let's start out by talking about 100% linen yarns. These are what I use most often just because it's a personal preference as to how the finished fabric feels. Some of the brands that are out there right now are the Quince & Co Sparrow, All You Knit Is Love Pearlwise, Fibra Natura Flax, Euroflax Sport. There are many brands out there that are producing very similar yarns to this. 100% linen yarns have a lot of drape and they will feel very dry and almost cool to the touch. The yarn itself has basically no elasticity, as you can see here. And these yarns will tend to have really nice stitch definition when it comes to simple lace patterns or twisted stitches in a garment. This is a simple bottom-up tank top that I improvised a few years ago. It has a keyhole neckline with a, a loop for the buttonhole. It has this panel of twisted stitches and lace in the front, and then I also did a pico hem at the bottom. This is what I'm wearing in the video today. One of the really nice things about linen yarns and a lot of plant yarns is that you often can get away with not adding an edging on your garment. So we're just looking at the stockinette edge here at the armhole. I hope you can really get a sense of how fluid this finished fabric is. It has a weight and a drape to it that's unlike any other plant fiber yarns. And you can see that although the stockinette fabric isn't totally see-through, depending on your gauge and what else you have going on pattern-wise on the front of your garment, you may want to wear something underneath this. This one is one of my favorite summer cardigans. This is the bird pattern from Amirisu Magazine. Another characteristic of these linen yarns is that they will hold a block very, very well. So I have only blocked this once and I have worn it probably three dozen times. And I used to take it to the office and just throw it over whatever I was wearing in the summer. If you need just a little something to take the edge off the air conditioning, this has been perfect. This one was my first ever linen garment. This is the Lena by Carrie Bostick Hogue. And here you can see another characteristic of these linen yarns when they are knit in the round, they will tend to bias. So if you're knitting the body of a garment or uh, some sort of tube in the round, you can see from the split hem at the bottom on the left there that the body of the garment is just torquing just a little bit. Whether that really bothers you is a matter of personal preference, of course. Here we have the Ginkgo Fight by Emily Green. Now this is a pattern that I substituted 100% linen for a mostly wool yarn in the original pattern. And so this was a little bit of a risk to take at the time. You can see that the linen is showing this open work lace at the front of the garment very well, but there are a few details that were a little bit more tailored that were sort of risky to do in a linen garment, like these folded cuffs on the sleeves. There's a folded neckline that ended up working out beautifully in the linen, so I'm really happy with that. And then here again, you can see how nicely this mesh worked out and how beautifully the drape and weight of this is hanging. And this is my modified version of the Tenya by Caitlin Hunter, which I described a little bit in detail in my Rhinebeck video from last year. For the edge treatment on these armholes, I just picked up stitches, knit one round, and then bound off all knit-wise. So that is how I did that. 
And then down here at the bottom, I actually beaded this lace, which gives the bottom of the garment even more drape and helps it hang very flat and really preserve those lace patterns. Now this was still pretty early on in my experience with knitting with linen, and so you can see that the fabric on this garment is not particularly even. This has been blocked and it still is sort of looking like this up close, but when you get further back, all of those inconsistencies really disappear and you don't see them. Here again, you can just see the beautiful fluidity of this fabric that this yarn makes. It's really incredible. This is the Ellery by Elizabeth Doherty. I've made an entire video about the making of this top, which I will link below, but this is also a 100% linen, but it's an Aran weight and the yarn has a tube construction. So it's a slightly different construction from the earlier linen we were talking about, but the characteristics of the fabric are very similar. Lots of weight, lots of drape. These tube yarns tend to be very round and smooth, so you will often get pretty good stitch definition like in the yoke of this sweater. And even though this yarn is an air in weight, I personally don't find that this feels too heavy in the summer. Now let's move on to talk about 100% cotton yarns. I have three examples here, but there are such a wide variety of cotton yarns out there available, all different kinds of structures of the yarns as well. So we're just gonna talk about these three because these are what I have in my stash right now. This Knit Picks crochet thread is pretty much equivalent to a lace weight yardage if you're knitting with it. So there is nothing that is stopping you from knitting with this, even though it's labeled crochet thread. So either way, I like using this yarn. This yarn is really shiny, it's very smooth, and you'll often see yarns that look like this that are labeled mercerized cotton. That just has to do with how the yarn is treated um, as it's being spun in order to sort of give it this smoothness and strength and shine. The finished fabric will be very similar to the finished linen fabric that we just looked at, except I find that cotton will often be just a little bit stiffer. This is the Yesteryear Top by Mimi Alalis, and this is a pattern that I crocheted last summer. In these detail shots, you can see the excellent stitch definition that you get with such a shiny and firm yarn, and I really love the scalloped edge at the bottom. Here you can see what I mean about the fabric being just a little bit stiffer than the linen. You can see that it, it holds its shape in a more solid way, and it almost feels like you could wrinkle it by squeezing too hard. This yarn will also hold a nice block, so you can see in the lace yoke here, this just looks absolutely beautiful. You can see the pattern very clearly when it's on the body. The next 100% cotton we'll be talking about is the Dando Yarns DK Cotton. I made an entire video about this project that I used this yarn for also, which I will link below. And so this yarn is very interesting. You will find a lot of Japanese companies doing these types of yarns, which are made over in Japan. They almost feel like a paper ribbon. And so these particular yarns, you can get wet, like in order to block it, but some of them are actually made out of a paper. So check the label. Here is the project I made out of this yarn, which is the Staple Linen Top by Hohi Locatelli. I was a test knitter for this and it was a really fun experience. This was another instance where there was no edging put on the armhole of the garment. This is just the bare edge of the stockinette left to sort of gently roll to the inside. It rolls slightly more than the linen does. And you can see how the flat texture of that yarn will cause the finished fabric to be just a little bit see-through. This is another one I always wear something underneath just personally. And here you can see again that the drape is just a little bit stiffer than that linen. It still has a little bit of heft. This is a DK weight here. And you can also see just the, the irregularity in the fabric, which is sort of a feature of the yarn as opposed to a bug. This Ruana style pattern is the Mirror by Yumiko Alexander, who is the founder of Dando Yarns. This pattern uses the fingering weight version of that tape yarn that we just looked at, and it actually holds two strands of it together to get a marled color. I chose a really subtle combination here of light gray and white because I didn't want it to really compete with the lace, but you can do, of course, any kind of crazy color combo you want. Even though this pattern has a lot of fabric, the quality of this yarn, that tape construction, makes it so that the fabric is still very light. And actually, if you could hear it in person, I tried to get a recording of this, but it wasn't coming through. It sounds like crispy, like you can really hear the dryness of this fabric as you are running it between your fingers. And it's just a really interesting experience. Now this yarn I haven't worked with yet, but I wanted to throw it in here to illustrate the fact that there are hand dyed cottons out there that are available and they look very similar to a hand dyed wool, but 
they're 100% cotton. So if you have a wool sensitivity or if you're trying to knit a summer garment and you just want to use a hand dyed yarn, there are lots of options out there for you. In contrast to the other two cotton yarns we just talked about, this one is extremely soft, so I imagine it would make a very soft finished garment, sort of like wool, but the yarn itself is still inelastic like a cotton. You will often be able to find a lot of gradient yarns that are made out of cotton. So this is one example. This is by Woolies Yarn Creations. There are others by all kinds of yarn companies, but here you can see that each skein gradually progresses from one color to another. This one is made up of multiple strands sort of just laying next to each other as opposed to being plied together, and it's also very inelastic. And this example was knit by my sister. This is the Reverse Psychology by Mindy Ross. This pattern was designed to go with this particular yarn, but I imagine you could use any number of color changing or variegated yarns to do this. And you can see how that color changing quality of this yarn is shown off in great effect like this in a side to side shawl. I also really love the addition of beads that my sister did here. This is another one that I feel is perfect to just dress up a summer outfit just slightly if you're going somewhere. This is another color changing cotton yarn that's out there. This is the Barocco Estiva in the Soka pattern by Amy Christophers. This pattern really illustrates the different effects that you can get in a garment or in another project, depending on where you start your skein. So this one, for instance, was started at the underbust and then finished at the bottom hem in a modular fashion. Now we're going to get into some blends. So the first one is a cotton and linen blend by Juniper Moon Farm. This is the Zoe base, which is very commonly available, at least here in the US. And if you look closely at this yarn, you can see that it almost has the look of one ply being shiny and one being dull. And when we look at the finished fabric in this Morning Mist tee by Annie Rowden, you can see that this quality is almost causing like a psychedelic pooling on the body of this garment, which is just something to note about the way this particular yarn is structured. If you see a yarn that has one ply different than another ply, oftentimes something like this will happen, and it ends up being sort of a feature of the garment, but you might want to keep your pattern a little bit more simple as opposed to doing some sort of complicated pattern or texture or lace on the garment. This yarn produces a solid enough fabric, at least at this gauge, that I feel comfortable going without a top or other shirt underneath this particular garment. And you can see that even though the yarn itself is textured, it will still work in this simple lace. Looking at another blend here, this is the Dando Yarns Silk Plus, which is a silk and cotton blend. This yarn has a very pebbly texture, it's a little bit uneven, and feels, again, very dry to the touch. It's also very inelastic, just like all of the other yarns that we've been talking about. And when you look at it close up, you can see that this texture is enhanced by the color variation where one fiber is taking the color differently than another. In the finished fabric, this results in a sort of marled look, and this is the Sunset Dunes again by Yumiko Alexander. With this being Yumiko's yarn, she really knows how to show it off to its advantage in this particular design, which has this folded neckline and a lot of interesting texture, including this panel at one side of the garment, which has all of these tuck stitches that pull the panel up to make one side asymmetrical. This fabric is very drapey, but I think it also has to do a lot with the oversized nature of this garment, uh, just the weight of itself causing a lot of that drape. And here we have yet another type of blend, which is a bamboo and acrylic blend. This is the Solis Top by Miriam Felton. Plant yarns that are blended with acrylic will often tend to be extremely soft. You can frequently find these at the big box stores, and they will tend to uh, be soft in texture. They'll tend to be a smooth yarn, so you get pretty good stitch definition, as you can see here. The finished fabric will often have a lot of shine and, yet again, have great drape. One of my very favorite blends is Cotton and Rayon. This is another hand-dyed yarn by Mary Gavin, who is out of the Phoenix area. This yarn, again, is inelastic. It has a very soft hand. And one of the things that I really enjoy about the Rayon content in this yarn is that it will almost give the yarn a sheen in some areas. It looks like it's metallic, but it's very, very subtle. And combined with Mary's very beautiful dye techniques, I just really love using this stuff. I've made a couple garments with it so far. 
This is the eavesdrop by Marie Green, which is knit in this Mary Gavin yarn. And so this is a very casual top that I think shows off the texture of the yarn really well in the stockinette body and then also in this little textured pattern on the sleeves. Again, you can see here that there are no edgings around the neckline and at the bottom of the garment. And it also has these uh, this seam detail down the front. You can see again, the drape is great. Uh, it's a really cool to wear in the summer, like cool temperature wise. And this is the Sycamore Vest by Hannah Fettig, which is made in a different colorway of the same yarn. And I wish that I had chosen a more flattering color for myself because unfortunately I, I don't really wear this color, but it shows off the yarn so beautifully. I just can't bring myself to give it away yet. Occasionally you'll see like really funky yarns that clearly have lots and lots of different textures going on. So this is the Something in the Air Cowl by Hohi Locatelli and I made this using Long Yarns Ella, which is one of these yarns that has metallics and dull sections and thick and thin and there's a lot going on. And so I chose this pattern mainly because I wanted to see how all of those little textures would play out in the simple body of the pattern, but all of these little picots on the edge end up being different yarn textures. And I find that to be really satisfying. It was a fun make and it's also sort of cool to wear in the summer in the same way as that shawl, you know, it can just sort of dress something up a little bit. Next, I would like to talk about cotton cashmere. This is a very common blend, uh, usually mostly cotton with just a little touch of cashmere, and it comes at a variety of price points, so don't let the addition of cashmere put you off thinking it's going to be too expensive. There can also be a variety of textures even within cotton cashmere yarn. So this is the Katya blend, and you can see it's a very smooth yarn. This is a sport weight. It's still very inelastic, still behaves like cotton. And then here we have the Rowan cotton cashmere, which is a slightly heavier weight, but you can see it also has more variation in texture on the surface of the yarn. This will affect the finished fabric as well. Here you can see a close-up comparison with the Katya on the left and the Rowan on the right. This is the Lydia 2.0 pattern, which I made using that Katya yarn. I wear this all the time in the summer. It is a little tricky just because of the thinness of the straps to figure out how to wear it, but usually I'll throw it on over a dress, or if I don't care if anybody sees my bra, I'll just go for it. The fabric this yarn creates is very soft, but I think that that has more to do with the cotton itself. I mean, the cotton is such a high percentage in these yarns that like that little bit of cashmere might be making a difference in the softness, but it's just, it's very pleasant to wear next to the skin. You can see that the density of the fabric is pretty good if you're knitting it at a reasonable gauge. So you ordinarily don't really need to wear something underneath these garments unless you're knitting at a loose gauge. And here you can see one of my works in progress. I am using that Rowan cotton cashmere yarn. It's my first time knitting with it and I do like it. You can see I'm using my wooden lick and needles here. And I wanted to show this so that you can see that like my tension's not perfect. You know, this is going to block out and be a reasonably even fabric by the end of this whole thing. Uh, you can see again, the density is pretty good. I'm not really worried about what I'm gonna wear underneath this one. And you can see that because the yarn itself has a little bit of texture, the finished fabric will have just a little bit of texture texture itself. The last yarn we're looking at today is the Shibui Knits Cohen, which is a linen and silk blend. And I did not make a summer garment with this, but I wanted to show you how you can actually use a plant fiber yarn in a winter garment. If you've been watching for a little while, you will maybe remember that I used this yarn held together with one strand of mohair for my Mariposa jacket by Helga Isayer. This was when I was deep into my experimentation phase of combining different colors of mohair with different base yarns, but I wanted to show this to you today to illustrate the fact that this garment, even though it is a winter garment, is still going to largely behave like that linen and silk blend that is serving as the base yarn here. So you can see that there's a lot of drape, there's a lot of heft, and you can also see that the buttonhole is having a little bit of a hard time holding its shape. It gets stretched out easily, and so at this point I'm just trying to be careful with it. I don't put a lot of strain on that buttonhole because it is a garment that has a lot of positive ease, so that is at least putting a little bit less strain on it than if it was a garment that was closer fitting. So what are the important takeaways from all this? Going into knitting with plant fibers for the first time, be kind to yourself. Don't worry so much if your tension isn't perfect at first or if you feel like you're struggling, that's okay, you're learning a new thing. 
If you're used to wool, working with these types of yarns will likely feel totally different to you. One of the things I like to do is to have a wool garment going at the same time as I'm doing a plant fiber garment. It gives me the chance to still knit and work on one of my projects if I have had enough of working with the plant fiber, if it's stressing my arm a little bit, or if I just am not enjoying the process as much. I can do a couple rows on my plant fiber garment and then move over to my wool garment and still get the same personal satisfaction out of knitting that I usually do. Takeaway number two is that there are a huge variety of plant fiber yarns out there for every price point. You can often find very nice quality cotton or bamboo or blended plant fiber yarns at the big box store. When you're there and you're feeling everything, they will likely have yarns that are meant to make dishcloths. Those I wouldn't try to use for a garment necessarily because they're oftentimes too soft. They almost feel like they might have a tendency to pill. Uh, and so that type of thing, you know, if you're spending the time on knitting a garment, I would avoid the ones that are clearly meant for making dishcloths. There are usually others that are made of cotton or bamboo in the same sort of vicinity that will feel nicer. The, the finish will be a little bit smoother. They might be shiny. Uh, they'll likely have a lot of different colors that look maybe appropriate for a garment. And so those are the ones that you wanna focus on and try to find something that you like the feel of. Takeaway number three is that your needle material really matters. The wooden needles are typically very easy to find. Most shops that I've seen tend to have some sort of bamboo needle, like a clover bamboo needle. I have a lot of those floating around from over the years and I use those and I'm perfectly happy with them. The Licka needles, of course, are very popular right now. Another thing that you might consider if you already have an interchangeable set that has metal needles. Oftentimes those companies will also make a wooden tip for their cables that you already have. I have the Chowgu metal interchangeable set, for example, and so I have purchased a couple of wooden tips to go with that set. If you really like the Chowgu cord, which I know a lot of us do, that's sort of a nice way to try out a wooden needle and still be used to like your, your usual cords that you like. So that is all that I have for you today. I hope that you have enjoyed this. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. I would be happy to continue the discussion in the comments. My next special episode that I have coming out in the next few months will be a needle review of the types of needles that I currently use and when I might choose to use a specific needle for a certain project. So if you would like to keep an eye out for that, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell so that you'll be notified every time I post a new video. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.